Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, which is the third presentation of the Environmental Resilience Lecture Series brought to you by the Environmental Protection Agency and the IIEA. Throughout the course of this series, international experts address topics such as the circular economy, air quality, environmental governance, the bioeconomy, sustainable waste management, water quality, and climate change. On behalf of the IIEA, I would like to thank the EPA for their sponsorship of this series. Today is Earth Day 2021, and we are delighted to be joined by Inger Anderson, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. I would like to thank her for finding the time to speak with us today. Inger Anderson has been Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme since 2019. Between 2015 and 2019, she was the Director General of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Ms. Anderson has more than 30 years of experience in international development economics, environmental sustainability, strategy, and operations. For 15 years at the World Bank, um, she held several senior leadership positions, including Vice President of the Middle East and North Africa, Vice President for Sustainable Development, and Head of the Sijar Fund Council. Previously, uh, Ms. Anderson worked for 12 years on drought, desertification, and water management at the UN, including at the UN Sudan Sahelian Office and UNDP. The title of today's address is Circularity to Restore the Earth. Ms. Anderson will speak to us for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and after her presentation, we will go to a Q&A session with uh, you, our audience. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, which you should see on, on your screen. And uh, feel free to send your questions in throughout the session. You don't need to work to wait until, until the end. And it would be helpful if you identify yourself and if any affiliation when you ask a question. Uh, a reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A session are on the record. And also feel free to discuss, to, to uh, join the discussion on Twitter using the handle uh, EPA understroke, understroke uh, IIEA. First, please allow me to hand over to Laura Burke, Director General of the EPA, for some opening remarks. Laura. Thank, thank you very much, Owen. Um, and I'm sorry, just... This, the, the virtual world is, is confusing me a little bit mo for the moment, but first of all, thank you very much, Owen, and really delighted. The first thing I should say, we're really delighted to be uh, joined, uh, joining with the IIEA on this Environmental Resilience Lecture Series. Um, it really, the aim is really uh, to bring all stakeholders together behind a collective message of resilience, emphasizing both individual as well as societal responsibility uh, to be good stewards of our shared environment. And really by taking concerted efforts to improve air and water quality, by reimagining waste cycles, and by focusing on raising environmental standards and governance, we can address pressing climate, ecological, and biodiversity crises. So delighted to be working in partnership with the IIEA and really delighted that uh, Inger Anderson is joining us today to talk to us about the circular economy. Uh, which is so topical in Ireland at the moment. And, and if you let me just for a couple of minutes uh, talk to you about why, um, and hopefully that'll put in context uh, Inger's talk as well. So really moving to a circular economy is critical for Ireland. It's critical, of course, in terms of protecting our environment, but also protecting our economy and protecting local jobs. Our current model of consumption is built on convenience through short-lived or single-use products and disposable packaging. This happens in our homes, in our businesses, work sites all across the country. We really live in a throwaway society. 
The marketing-driven nature of our economy supercharges this behavior, urging replacement of products to ensure we are armed with the latest gadgets, fashions, homewares, long before we get full use of the, the products we have. Put simply, uh, there really isn't enough thought about where our stuff comes from or what happens when we're done with it. So we're busy accumulating more and more stuff, uh, but really looking at the the full life cycle of that stuff and whether we need it isn't taught through currently. So we're now developing a new national circular economy program in the EPA, and that's to be a driving force for Ireland's move to a circular economy by businesses, householders, um, and the public sector. Creating a resource efficient economy and resilient society requires rapid and far reaching transformation across all sectors. And the EPA's circular economy program will support government strategy and translate national circular ambitions into the daily activities in workplaces and homes across Ireland. And I suppose what we're really doing is translating that aspiration into implementation on the ground. But our new program in a way isn't completely new. It really builds on 15 years of leadership by the EPA on waste prevention and resource efficiency um, starting from, from when Ireland and the EPA launched our first programme of this type in Europe back in 2000, 2004, 2005. Um, and our work in this area includes Ireland's well-regarded reg food waste prevention programme, uh, the groundbreaking smart farming initiative, and the development of national guidance on priority topics such as construction waste and green public procurement. And we also support, and this is, I suppose, more recently, the Circu Circulaire, which is an innovation and networking platform established just last year with 26 leading manufacturers to bring circularity into Ireland's manufacturing sector. We also, and I suppose this is my pitch to, to as many of you in the audience as possible, we also provide support funding to innovators and companies in the circular economy through our Green Enterprise Programme. And that's going to open for new proposals this year in May. And to give you an example of the type of things we fund, uh, an example of our work in this area is the support we've given to St. Mel's Brewery and Panaletto Bakery in Longford to come together to use surplus bakery products as a raw material for beer manufacturing. And that circular economy that I'd have to say, I think is great and it's the type of circular economy I like. But working like this not only, of course, realizes value from a material that would otherwise have gone to waste, but it creates a new product and that product has strong sustainability uh, pedigree. So uh, I suppose to encourage you all to, to, uh, to think about that and maybe bid for that program. In addition to that, we currently have a consultation program open asking about asking public and businesses to help shape this new circular economy program I was talking about. So we want your views um, and your thoughts with regard to the program's objectives and priorities. And it's available there on the on the EPA website. So again, really ask you to, to engage with us on that consultation. But that's it from me. Um, I now really look forward to hearing Inger's thoughts, her experience, her expertise, and, and bringing how that can be brought into the Irish context and how we in Ireland can move closer to a circular economy. So I'm going to hand over to Inger. Thank you very much and thanks for taking the time today. Well, thank you so very much uh, to you, Director General Laura Burke, and also to Professor Owen Lewis. Uh, for this kind invitation and of course to the EPA as a whole and IAEA for, for doing the work that you do and for really pushing the issue of circularity. I'm sorry I'm not with you in, in, in person. Only two short years ago I had the great pleasure of being in Ireland for the biodiversity conference that was held in February of 2019, yes, and um, it was uh, uh, again, another example of Ireland's uh, leadership and really seeking to lean in on these critical issues of our times. Because in these trying times, when we talk about resilience, most people turn to how to respond and recover from COVID-19 pandemic. And it's true that the pandemic has brought a lot of suffering, we know. 
millions of people have died. The global economy has contracted by around 4% in 2020 and livelihoods have collapsed with an estimated 120 million people pushed into extreme poverty just last year. But resilience go beyond COVID-19. This pandemic is but one symptom of how our planet's ailing health is affecting our own. Today on what in the UN they refer to as International Mother Earth Day, um, we have to think about hard about how to radically alter our relationship with nature and for the better. Today, we have to turn our minds to the solutions, the solutions to the three planetary crises that we and UNEP speak of, the climate crisis, the biodiversity and nature crisis, and the pollution and waste crisis. It's only in addressing these crises together, these interconnected crises, that we can truly build that resilience. Um, and as con uh, unsustainable consumption and unsustainable production, as we just heard from you, uh, Professor Ber uh, Director General Burke, are really the very drivers of these crises. So we can only build resilience if we make the global economy entirely circular. So how to do that? Well, I hope to get to that through today's uh, talk, because there are pro a tremendous potential to create prosperous, sustainable, and a peaceful planet. And the actions we can take will help get us there. But first, let me just give some brief numbers of why we have no option but to change. And let me start with the climate crisis, because as we all know, climate is in serious trouble. Atmospheric greenhouse gases, are higher than they've been for 800,000 years. And as a result, the planet is warming. We've been already seeing these disruptive changes in our lives, in precipitation, in melting of ice sheets, in glaciers, and most recently and frequently, obviously, in extreme weather events across the world. We know that we've not done enough, even with the Paris Accord and its goals to limit global warming to under two degrees and to pursue 1.5. Now, the new net zero commitments are interesting and important, and they are covering much of the world's emissions, but um, targeting 2050. But promises is not what's going to get us there, obviously. It's the actions that we need to take. And right now, with what we're doing, we are hurtling toward above three degrees. And so that's a little bit on the climate crisis, now a little bit on biodiversity and nature. We humans, we've altered about 75% of the terrestrial surface of the Earth and about 66% of the marine surface. Around 1 million of the around 7.8 million species that we have on this good Earth face extinction. And around 10% of forests have been lost since 1990. So again, we, we made promises in 2010, we agreed under the Biodiversity uh, Convention on a series of targets that we should have reached last year. We have met none of these 20 targets. The bottom line is that we cannot survive without nature and biodiversity. We cannot grow food, have, them, have our foods be pollinated and our crops be pollinated, regulating the weather, the filter, the water and so on without biodiversity. And finally, of course, the third crisis pollution and waste, that toxic trail of pollution and waste that we leave behind that is growing. Every year pollution is causing premature 9 million deaths, from, primarily from dirty air, up to 400 million tons of heavy metals, solvents, toxic sludge and other industrial waste enter the world's waters annually, an estimated 2.2 uh, billion tons of municipal solid waste was generated in 2016. This is expected to grow to 3.4 billion tons by 2050 if we keep going with that throwaway society that we just heard you refer to, Director General. So have we done enough? We all know the answer. No, we have not. And these three crises have devastating economic and social implications. In the Sustainable Development Goals, we've set these lofty ambitions to create a planet of peace and plenty but the accelerating planetary crisis are really undermining those hard-won development gains and impeding progress. For example, even small increases in temperature um, risks uh, uh, pose risks to health, to food security, to water supply, and to human security. In 2018 alone, damages from climate-related natural disasters 
costs about $155 billion. So again, I mentioned the loss of pollinators, critical to more than 75% of the world's food crops. Loss of those threaten annual global crops outputs at a worth about, well, between 235 billion to around above 500 billion. So meanwhile, of course, since the mid 20th century, at least 40% of all intrastate conflicts, conflicts between nations have been linked to somehow the exploitation of or the competition for natural resources. So the burden of this environmental decline is always felt disproportionately by the poor and by the most vulnerable and future generations will suffer even more. So there's also that intergenerational inequity here. So the way we produce use and discard is responsible for these crises. At the heart of these crises lies our unsustainable model of consumption and production. Metals, wood, food, fiber, electronics, you name it, we waste it. We're throwing away money, throwing away resources, throwing away our chance for a, human, for a future of human health, for a future of prosperity and for a future of equity. And only a root and branch transformation of the way we produce and the way we consume will enable humanity to achieve a well being for all within the Earth's finite capacity. So it's time to change our ways starting this year through this pandemic recovery, through stronger nationally determined contributions, that promissory note that we are gonna give into the Paris Accord every five years and coming up now for Glasgow. And that's how we're gonna make the Paris goals achievable and reachable. That's how we're gonna reach long-term sustainability, uh, sustainability through ambitious biodiversity framework that we're gonna agree in Kunming at COP15 under the Biodiversity uh, Convention and through implementation of all the pollution and waste related conventions. Scaling up circularity and sustainable consumption and production has to be at the heart of these processes. And that is the 12th SDG, sustainable consumption and production. In every single sector, circularity and sustainable consumption and production can deliver these enormous environmental, economic and social benefits. Just consider a couple of points. Applying circular closed loop approaches and demand side measures to the processing of steel, aluminium, cement, and plastic could achieve as much as 56% of the EU's 2050 emissions reductions for industry. That's worthwhile noting. So the global clothing industry, for example, emits more greenhouse gases than the international flights and maritime shipping combined. Not that they have flights and shipping should get a free pass, but we need to understand the footprint of our own consumption. That global, global, global clothing industry is responsible for growing land conversion by developing circular design measures, you, using secondary raw materials and providing consumers with easy to access reuse and repair services. Circular economy can cut these emissions and the use of land to grow materials. So promoting reparability, upgradability, and availability of spare parts, software support, and material recovery in electronics, for example, could contribute to the fight against climate change and reduce the need to gorge new materials from the earth. Collection and recycling only applies to 17% of e-waste produced uh, globally. In this regard, we're proud at UNEP to be supporting a number of countries, let me mention here Nigeria, as a major importer of used electronics to develop a circular model for the electronic value chain, which can be replicated across Africa. So circularity can also build the resilience in our economies. The pandemic has shown the fragility and the limited flexibility of many of the global supply chains, for example, um, countries such as Cambodia or Bangladesh, for whom textile exports and products represent about 84% of exports. We've seen orders worth over 1.4 billion cancelled during the pandemic. And the current industrial agricultural models, meanwhile, rely on fossil fuels. 
practices that damage ecosystems and supply chains and involve long distance transport and seasonal workforces. As a result, lockdowns have stressed food supplies in many, many places. Circularity can provide credible solutions to, to strengthen such fragile systems. In food systems, for example, large scale investments in regenerative, peri-urban uh, production can bring food closer to consumers, reduce environmental impacts and fragility. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation research has highlighted that a circular scenario, scenario could lead to 50% reduction of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers for use uh, by, by 2030 in Europe compared to uh, when we compare to 2012. And at the same time, it could result in a 12% drop in household expenditure. So friends and colleagues, with many of these benefits up for grabs, we are seeing a surge in circular, uh, circularity related initiatives. And we just heard that from you, Director General. The EU's uh, Circular Economy Action Plan foresees a cleaner and more competitive Europe. The African Circular Economy Alliance is concentrated <clears throat> excuse me, on low emission and climate resilient models that can emphasize green innovation and job creation. And the Latin American and Caribbean Circular Economy Coalition and the Global Alliance for Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency, both launched in February just now, are working in the same space. So the good thing is that there are these alliances forming, there are constituencies nationally, there are locally um, uh, communities uh, that are moving this uh, dial. There are many country efforts and initiatives and promises and cities are also doing a great deal. Uh, let me mention this, the city of Phoenix, not necessarily a city you would know about in this topic, but the city of Phoenix has increased its recycling of waste to 36% by mid-2019, only from only 20% in 2015. So in three years, they've increased by 16%. In Accra, Ghana, 95% of all electronic and waste, um, electronic and electrical waste, much of it imported from Europe, is collected. And most of this collection is informal. Uh, it has uh, health impacts and efforts are therefore underway to train workers to safely and effectively recycle this waste. But we need to accelerate the transition and not necessarily export our waste to elsewhere. So let me offer up some suggestions for how we can create the necessary conditions to shift to real circularity. A few points. First, governments must, must use the pandemic recovery stimulus to shift gears to circularity. Anything else would be nearly unforgivable. UNEP research shows that some investment has already gone into a green recovery and that's a good thing. In 2020, about 86 billion was announced globally for green transport infrastructure. And that's a smart move um, as a shared and circular mobility system could mitigate all three crises that I spoke about and potentially reduce cost of travel by around 70%. But similarly, let's talk about the construction industry because green building investment received about 32, 35 billion uh, in, in this recovery endeavor, largely for building upgrades and for energy efficiency. Such funds could also promote uh, new building techniques and more circular use of building materials. Uh, investments in green research and development stood at around 28 billion. And so that's a good thing. But each of these, we have to realize that according to our assessment, only 2.5% of all the spending that has gone into um, the, the recovery and only 18% uh, percent of the spending made in 2020 is likely to drive greenhouse gas emissions. So we need much more. So the first point was using the green recovery efficiently to drive circularity. The second point is that we have to reform economic and financial systems because they are the way, they are the ones that give us the mortgages that use virgin materials. They are the ones that can help shift together with government regulations. So let us think about how to reform economic and financial systems. 
Again, we're seeing good movements on this front, but no debt and equity instruments related to the circular economy existed in 2017. And by mid 2020, 10 public equity funds on circular economy had been launched. That's a good thing. According again to Ellen MacArthur Foundation, assets managed through such funds grew from a under, under a billion to two billion in the first half of 2020, outperforming many other funds in the same category. Other financiers are seeing the way the market is moving. Since 2019, at least 10 corporate bonds to finance circularity have been issued. And since 2016, there have been about a tenfold increase in the number of private market funds investing in circular activities in the economy. So a similar trend we're also seeing in bank lending and product finance and insurance. But we need to have the government guardrails alongside of this because it is the consumption of you and I, the clothes we buy, the vehicles we drive, the houses we own, etc., that is part of the issue. So pointing fingers is at, at in industry is not enough. Recent research from UNEP's finance initiative does tell us that the finance sector need to do three things to speed up reform. Integrate transition to circularity into the organization's strategy and identify risks and opportunities to that linear business model versus a circular one. And disclose the level of financing for circularity that they have on the balance sheet. And this is important because the banks, of course, are supporting economic activities in the real sectors, but the banks do not necessarily control this without government regulations. So businesses and investors are essential to drive this. And yesterday with Mark Carney and John Kerry, we launched a new alliance precisely to help drive this. But a major impediment to sustainable design practices is that sustainable products and services are often more expensive. Businesses offering repairs and refurbished products struggle to compete with newly manufactured products with labor costs rendering their margins too slim. So we need to ensure that incentives and taxes drive businesses and consumers to adopt circular solutions. And that starts with putting a price on carbon, facing up harmful subsidies, and redirecting subsidies towards supporting solutions that contribute to circularity and to regenerative economics. So shifting taxation from production and labor to, to resource use and waste is one way of doing it. Uh, taxation can be used as a disincentive, uh, for example, by applying a tax to products that do not include a recycled content. So that was my second point shifting the economy. But the third point here is to improve the ability of small and medium sized enterprises to deal with these external shocks by helping them move to circularity. And that's key. And so we know that across the OECD, SMEs account for 99% of all businesses. So how to do that? And here we're working with Kenya, South Africa, Tunisia, and many other industry uh, countries to support industries to do just that. There are financial barriers. There is a lack of government support. There is a lack of technical skills. So this is what we have to drive and ensure. And my fourth point is that we need to manage the shift to support industries and people uh, to, uh, in, in resource producing countries. Because if we want to transition to circularity and if we want it to stick and to be fair, it has to create decent jobs in the world's poor countries, in the world's more vulnerable countries, and they are often the resource exporting countries. So that's an important dimension that the wealthier countries need to take into account as they move forward on circularity. Because there will be certain losses and certain sectors will wind down. Countries can build on the experience of managing transitions for workers um, for example, in the Netherlands, when the coal mines closed, well, um, it did affect about 50,000 workers. So putting that social safety net and retraining and redirecting economic activities become key. All the more important for the poorest countries, the resource exporters, where we need to ensure through trade and through investments that we can help them prosper. So friends, shifting to circularity is a complicated task. 
and it is one that needs a whole of society approach. Today, we've assessed the role of governments, the private sector and financial institutions, but we should not forget that labor organizations, scientific and educational bodies, media, households, academic uh, organizations and universities, civil society groups are also very well positioned to initiate, to demand the transformation to circularity. They should all be empowered to voice and to be part of the solution. A carefully managed transition to circularity and sustainable consumption and production will be absolutely critical as we seek to deliver on the sustainable development goals, to deliver on a world that is uh, in accord with Paris and 1.5, and to deliver ambitious biodiversity and pollution agendas. It's essential uh, to recover from the pandemic in a way that does not give us back to the old group groove does not store up more problems for the future because let us remember the pandemic stimulus is not money that was sitting in our accounts it is monies that we are borrowing from future generations so let us not leave that next generation with a broken planet as well as an insurmountable debt this is within our reach it will be essential for resilience of our economies and with all of a society approach and a global approach, we can do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Executive Director Anderson. Um, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot for a thought there. Um, I, I must say that that almost final remark that you make about how these these assets which have grown in bank accounts our borrowings from the future is a very uh, telling moment. But I, I think it's very clear from your remarks, the radical nature of the transition that is, that is in, uh, uh, involved and the opportunities which uh, present themselves in coming out of the, uh, the, this uh, awful experience. Um, there are uh, quite a few questions. So perhaps if I might turn to uh, some of these um, uh, and uh, well, let me let me start off with one. Um, uh, how can we best address inbuilt obsolescence, which is particularly prevalent, perhaps in digital products? Is there a global standard that could be applied? So the question of obsolescence, and maybe particularly in those, that group of products. As of today, there is no global standard that could be applied. I think we at UNEP, we have, a, we have a, 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 a large initiative that works precisely on e-waste, um, which, which uh, has, um, as we know, a very detrimental environmental impact, especially when we see open, open burning of the plastics uh, that often encase um, the electronics or indeed uh, open melting of the, the metals that are within this electronics. A number of companies are working on setting up um, 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 de-assembly and re-assembly, um, but I will invite most of the participants here to open a drawer with their old cell phones uh, just to consider how we are um, use uh, and, and uh, how we're using our electronics in an inappropriate way um, and how we uh, when we upgrade simply either throw it away or leave it in a drawer but we need to understand that there are fantastic materials in these products and rather than going to uh, other countries and continuing as i said gorging the earth we need to set up these um, uh, this recyclability which means that the design it comes from the very design of products um, and here, uh, electronics is a good, a good example. But packaging is another. When we double layer uh, a paper with a plastic, we've already prevented recycling in, a, in, a, in an easy form. So we need to think about, from every product, how we do this. And this is where governments, based on the science and people like ourselves in UNEP bring in, based on the kind of global agreements that we underpin, can help support. But at this point, there are no broader global agreements, although many electronic companies are indeed speaking to this point. Thank you. Um, 
as it happens, uh, just as you were speaking, a, a question came in, which is quite closely related, but it's interesting because it's from Gareth Blaney, who is chair of our communications regulator uh, in Ireland. And he thanks you firstly for an inspiring talk, but asks, do you have any thoughts on what actions could be taken by the telecommunications sector to improve the circular economy and how we should encourage these actions? So you've you started to address those questions. Yes, I mean, absolutely. So there is a side for the regulate for the regulatory arm uh, at the national or any other way, or and there is a side for the individual um, um, produce uh, the individual um, purveyor of uh, telecommunications. Uh, so um, buybacks are happening uh, in a number of places. When you get your new phone, you can get a reduction. If it's like your old car, right? You get a reduction if you sell if you sell back then what happens then once you have sold it back it's out of your your desk drawer but what happens to it and that is of course where and i won't mention specific companies but some companies are beginning to and any any listener can google and find out which companies which large electronic companies are beginning to um, to have a disassembly and then uh, reuse um, we need more of that and we could also imagine a situation where there would be um, incentivized by by the public side uh, to if you if your device has got a degree of reassembly within it, there would be some incentives to buying this. Just like we're doing now with e-vehicles, etc. We want to shift public behavior, uh, consumer behavior, to that uh, to that uh, level. So. On the one hand, the regulatory side from governments, and certainly on the other hand, um, um, industry setting up uh, buybacks and, and easy disassembly. Today, the way these uh, items are constructed makes it quite hard to disassemble and to get the individual, but, but this, is, this is a solvable engineering, uh, electronic engineering issue that can be addressed. Yeah, and your point about connecting, so the right incentives are in place. Yes. Um, which underlines your point about the holistic approach to this so that several sectors need to collaborate to deliver the, the intended result. Uh, I, I, there's a question here, was, um, is the uh, 2015 papal encyclical Laudato Si uh, on the environment having an impact in tackling environmental degradation? Uh, a question from Ethnal Leahy. I, I absolutely think that when His Holiness Pope Francis came out with the encyclical and made it so clear that uh, the duty we have to our, our one and only earth is one that we cannot possibly um, take uh, lightly, that that brought into um, out, outside the environment bubble in which I live and it brought into um, uh, faith communities a deeper understanding and reflection. We at UNEP, we're very proud, we have an initiative that we call Faith for Earth, which combines many, many faiths, including obviously Christianity and obviously the Catholic uh, Church, um, in uh, bringing the voices of faith leaders uh, to the table, speaking to the science and speaking to the, the care that we have to take for our common home. So I do think that this uh, that the encyclical of 2015 coming at the time when we uh, when we also agreed on Paris, when we also agreed on the sustainable development goals was a very important move by the Catholic Church. Thank you. A, a student at our largest university at UCD Dublin, uh, Jonas Poulsen um, asks, what is hindering us from holding individuals or corporations responsible uh, in the same way as we hold individuals or nations responsible for crimes against humanity? I mean, Jonas is right, and he's asking a good question, and he should keep asking that because uh, it, it's only our own level of, or lack of ambition, if you like. We need to, frankly, uh, use all the voices we have, including the voice at the ballot box, to ensure that those we elect, and it is not a left or right issue, it is an environmental and intergenerational issue, 
um, that those we put in positions of making determinations for the future do so based on the science, the available environmental science. But each one of us in our consumption and production have a responsibility too. And many times people feel like, especially when you live with wealth, which we all do in the West when we compare to poorer countries. So turning off that light or walking instead of taking the car or um, recycling or whatever it is, or not purchasing more stuff that we are just gonna put in the cupboard. We, we may not understand that each of these actually have, uh, have an impact. And then there are the bigger picture, ensuring that um, our, our overarching um, climate goals are set with the level of ambition that we need to see. And maybe I saw that uh, Seamus McGarvey had a question here, so maybe I just pick that up because today we have the Climate Leaders Summit and we do need to see today that level of ambition, especially obviously, and we are hearing that that will come out from the US, which is back in the Climate Accord. And we were understood this morning that uh, there will be very ambitious announcements coming out of the summit, which we uh, greet with great uh, appreciation. We also very much appreciate and like to see the collaboration. It may be that there are different competition in other areas, but large emitters must agree and lead. And that includes China. And it's very good that there's Chinese and US conversations on this because it's only this way by the large emitters putting their foot forward that we can actually make it. Thank you. Um, there's a quite specific question uh, from Harold Kingston in the Irish Farmers Association. Um, he says that livestock manure is rightly classified as a fertilizer instead of waste. What place can the nutrients in human and industrial wastes have in the circular economy or in uh, safe food production? Well, thank you. I mean, first of all, um, as we speak about climate change, as we speak about biodiversity, this is a point I always make. The farmer is the friend, uh, not the enemy. Um, these are people across the world doing a critical job that ensure that you and I get food on our table. So um, we, we need to help farmers shift to uh, um, climate positive, biodiversity positive production, but never ever vilify the farming industry. Uh, that, that's sort of a point that I always have to make here. Um, and and, and the, the, the point here is that the kind of nutrients that we do have in, in, in our waste streams can be converted uh, to either biogas, as we see in a number of places, or to other uh, um, materials that we can use to enhance our soil uh, health and soil fertility. Um, and so the more we look into uh, research in this area, the more we look into, again, um, helping uh, that process so that these are not just wastes that go into the landfill, um, and then emit methane uh, by, by the, in their decomposition, but rather that they are uh, in biogas uh, digesters or indeed converted uh, to fertilizer or to other products is critical. And it is remarkable that with all the human ingenuity that we haven't really invested in this, and it is still a thing when you have a biogas digester in your local community. I mean, I just can't even believe that it should be a news item, but in my little community in Denmark, that's, that's a conversation piece that they have a biogas digester. It should be every community should have this because they would be able to generate energy or generate uh, heat uh, from some of these materials. I'm I, we're keeping up the, our audience is keeping up the diversity of a range of topics uh, 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 that they're posing uh, for you. And the next question I have here is from someone whom I, I, you, you may well have, have met, uh, Ambassador uh, David Donahue, who was uh, co-chair of the uh, SDG negotiations at the UN. Uh, he asks, the circular economy is a compelling model, but 
can more be done to bring out its benefits for the poorest countries and peoples, the social dimension, and not just the economic and environmental. I mean, let's think about it. Today, where some of these resources are extracted, um, either from the uh, original material or recycled, it is the dirtiest, most demeaning, most dangerous, most polluting jobs possible. Um, if anyone has been to an e-waste place in Africa or elsewhere, you will know what I'm talking about. There are often children, often people are bare feet, barefooted, often um, there's smoking fires from, from the plastics, etc. So you, you paint this picture. This is not decent work. This is not human dignity. Uh, but it is a day's living. And so what we need to do is to help those economies make shifts so that they're not necessarily dependent. And this, yes, we may need to disassemble, but let it be done in more factory-like clean conditions where there's decent work. So we can demand this um, if we set this, this, the guardrails again for the degree of recyclability, recycled materials that we would like to see in the materials that we buy. If we could, just like when we used to have sweatshops and then we began to demand that we would not buy things that were produced by pseudo slave labor. So I think we as consumers, we do have a role to play here. And, but the awareness is low about we, we buy the new phone and we don't necessarily think about where the old one went um, or, or the computer, what have you. Um, but I do think that that's, uh, that's a dimension and of course, in terms of industrial scale mining of new materials, we need to be mindful that these countries are dependent, as I said in my talk, on, their, on these exports. But we also need to be mindful of their finite, um, finite uh, ex of the finite nature of these resources. Um, so finding other ways of uh, supporting countries in making some of those shifts towards longer term sustainability has to be part and parcel of it, which is why in the sustainable development goal, we speak about leaving no one behind and we speak about equity and justice. Um, and climate justice is a key dimension as well as environmental justice at the global level. We, we have a question from um, a parliamentarian, um, uh, our former Minister for Communications, Climate Action and Environment, uh, Richard Bruton. And he, he asks, does the focus of Paris on the production side the inventory of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, 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 hampered the examination of the entire supply chain, which is at the heart of circularity. And how can that be addressed? You know, I mean, Paris is, a, is an agreement negotiated by 193 nations and agreed to by all. Um, so the last thing I will do is to criticize this agreement. Uh, but, you know, are there things I would have liked to have in it? Of course there are, right? I would have liked to have a closer link with biodiversity and so on. I would have liked to have had a clear price on target pertaining to Article 6 and a clearer language around circularity. But look, it is what it is. So no, it doesn't hamper, I would say, but it doesn't explicitly um, pronounce itself on the opportunities for CO2 reductions um, by uh, bringing about a circular economy um, and by looking at uh, the entire supply chain. Um, and that is what, but, but you could say that there are many other dimensions here that the Paris Agreement doesn't, doesn't deal with. Um, and it is for science then to raise, to raise this. And it is for science then to say, well, look, in renewables, there are these and these and these opportunities and to bring them to the fore, because the Paris Agreement also doesn't tell you which renewable is better than what, etc. Nor does it tell you about which uh, which recycle, which uh, circularity, sec which sector, to, if we were to bring it into circularity, will be give you the biggest bang for the buck. Um, but I think we need to take the Paris as the as the line of sight for where we have to reach, and then it is for us then to analyze and look at the entire economy and say. For this country, for that sector, these are the kind of um, commitments that we need to make. 
Um, I have quite a specific question from uh, Deirdre Lane. Um, she asks, where do you see wool as a non-plastic solution in fashion in insulation and reviving rural economies? It's currently being wasted globally. Wool. So wool, wool and cotton and other uh, materials. Um, so, I mean, obviously, uh, we should not be wasting textiles. <laughs> um, this is clear. And we should not be mixing synthetics with cottons. And uh, we really need to think about, just like we're recycling um, paper and plastic, we, we need to think about this. Um, so I don't know enough about wool to have a specific point here. But what I can say is, um, that we should really, once things are in the economy, what we're doing today is we're taking stuff out of the environment. We're putting it into the economy. That is a good thing. It creates jobs, opportunities, makes the wheels go around. But when we're done with it, we discard it as waste back into the environment. That is no longer an option. It needs to stay in the economy. And that's sort of the bottom line here that we need to think about. And textiles play an important role as to a number of other raw materials, uh, as to another uh, number of materials. Yeah, and in your talk, you did emphasize the importance, to the impact of the textiles industry, indeed. Um, uh, the, the industry that is my, where my own background lies, the construction industry, you, 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 you referred to that as well. It's responsible, of course, for a very substantial part of the raw materials extracted from, from the crust of our earth. Um, and yet it really seems internationally at quite an early stage in even, even having the necessary information, let alone take then moving on to take the necessary decisions, but in the information on, for instance, the life cycle of the, uh, uh, of the impacts of the materials being used uh, so that designers and constructors and so on could take the necessary decisions. You're absolutely spot on. And I, I mean, this is your field of expertise. Uh, we at UNEP, we've done a number of studies through the IRP, the International Resources Panel that we are proud to host. And here we emphasize the sort of weight of cities. I mean, what is, the, the, there was a, actually a publication we came out with that discusses the weight of cities in terms of climate and resource impact and, and, and the weight of industry. and the more we can construct with such a with 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 the with a circularity in mind obviously the much better we will be off as a global community um i have a, a question um from a postgraduate student in india mar brav um he says thank you for your insightful talk i would be interested to know your thoughts on whether you think that the circular economy is conceived the same way in developed and developing countries? Can we have a global uniform approach across economies or is circular economy to be viewed as a privilege? I'm glad that, that Meher Brave asks this question because it is a question to be responded to. I think in a number of countries, there's greater comfort with speaking with sustainable consumption and production, which is the title of the SDG. 12, as opposed to circularity, because in a number of countries, we have distinct underconsumption. We have 800 million people going to Hungary. We have 1.3 billion people living in abject poverty. And so the sense that the growth model that in the West was uh, sort of um, take, make and waste might still be, the linear model might still be um, the best way. It is not, however, the best way, because the job opportunities that are available in circularity, the opportunities for long-term competitiveness that are available from circularity are very real. But we need to understand that, um, that um, uh, poorer countries have an opportunity maybe to leapfrog across a polluting age and not to have to go through that cost of the cleanup that um, wealthy countries have had to do, to, to do. And moreover, at a time where um, overall population, we are um, soon 8 billion uh, people, um, uh, 
is such that what we will waste is so much more than what we did 100 years ago. The, op the option of just wasting and living with our waste and assuming that we can be healthy is, is a mirage. And so it is a, it is a conversation because global equity has to be part of it. And that means also global trade rules, understanding the full cost, um, a price on carbon. These dimensions need to be part and parcel of it because otherwise, and obviously living up to the promise of climate finance, $100 billion per year by 2020. These are part and parcel of the solution that need to be part of the global equity question. Thank you. Um, I, I think it probably has to be our, our last uh, question, but it seems to me to be a, a, a really key issue raised by a, a, a professor at Trinity College Dublin, uh, Claire Lode. Um, uh, she asks, how do you convince individuals that their individual personal actions, for example, not switching your engine off when waiting for your kids to come out of school, have a global impact. The message does not seem to get through, uh, Claire says. You know, there, I mean, thank you uh, to, for, for that question, because therein lies the understanding of individual responsibility. The world is made up of these seven point, what have you, billion people. And each one of us has a footprint. And you and I, we have a footprint that is massively bigger than that person in Bhutan and so or in Kenya or where have. so and and we want to we want to understand that oh, or we want to arrive at 1.5 the kind of footprint that we have truly matters I think what what we have understood is that just conveying the numbers just conveying the facts and the science is not enough we need to hit with the heart and maybe um you know, your children will probably tell you before you will do it because kids get it. Or maybe the faith communities will tell you about sustainability. So it is that people like myself who are in this environmental uh, community need to understand that it is when others, uh, often you hear the, the, the truth comes from the child or the truth comes or the, uh, the persuasion comes from communities, the arts, the music uh, uh, industry or, 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 or elsewhere. I think it's very hard. Um, we, we are now heading into COP26. That means that it's more than, than a quarter of a century where we have not agreed to do what we know we needed to do. And the science was clear 26 years ago, and actually it's 27 because we skipped 2020, the science was clear 27 years ago, and it is clearer every year, and yet we have not done it. So it is not about the science. It is about ensuring that there is political leadership, that the, that the communication is consistent, and that it is not taken hostage by political posturing. This is the only, the only path we can walk in terms of the future circularity, sustainability, climate action, and protecting nature, preventing pollution through, un, through sustainable consumption and production is the only way forward. It's the only way that we can ensure intergenerational equity. And so I will stop here, but uh, very much thanking for, for that last question, which sort of allowed me to wrap it up here. Well, it does, exactly. I think you have brought things together and I, I, it really strikes home when uh, in our own experience, certainly here, we've seen this, how uh, the, the, the schools, the school children coming back from projects and from exposures that they've experienced in the schools can be the drivers for change in, in the family, in, in shaming the, the parents. And, uh, so you, you've tackled an enormous topic today and you've tackled in a really elegant fashion. Uh, we are very much in your, in your debt, uh, Inger Anderson. So on behalf of the IIEA and I think the EPA as well, and of the several hundred people who have been party to this discussion, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me.